Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm Austin, Chief Executive of Different Strikes, and thank you so much for joining us this morning for the latest session in our 2021 virtual conference sponsored by Bolt, Bird and Kemp. I'm delighted today that we are joined by Claire Everett of Physiofunction. Claire is a neurophysiotherapist with a special interest in stroke rehabilitation. Claire's had links with different strokes for many years, so it's fantastic that she's able to join us this morning. Just before I hand over to Claire, just a couple of pieces of housekeeping. This session is being recorded, but everyone is viewing this in complete anonymity, and the only people that will appear on screen will be myself and Claire. You should see towards the bottom of your screen a few functions. Um, you'll see the chat function there. I can see we've had a number of comments in that already. Thank you very much. Please do use the chat to say hello to us. Let us know where you're watching. Let us know what you've had for breakfast, if you like, this morning. Um, in addition to that, we also have the Q&A function. We have had a number of questions in advance, which I'll be asking Claire after she's gone through her presentation. But if you'd like to ask any other questions, please do pop them in the Q&A function and we'll do our best to get to them later. If I could please ask though, if you, do, if you have questions, if you do put them in the Q&A and not in the chat, that would be very helpful. Anyway, with no further, further ado, I'd now like to hand over to Claire. Claire, it's all yours. Thanks, Austin. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's really uh, nice to be here this morning. Um, I'm in Northampton and it's a beautiful morning. It's nice bright blue sky and um, a nice bit of sunshine and I have porridge for my breakfast. <laughs> That's my confession. <laughs> right, so it's really nice to be here um, and thank you for the invite. So I've been involved with Different Strokes over a number of years um, and I, I know some of our, the local group in Northampton. Um, as a little short bit of introduction, I've been a physiotherapist for 25 years now, which feels like <laughs> a bit of amazing really but anyway 25 years has flown by doing the job that I love so that's great and most of it has been in neuro rehab um, so I, I have a, a lot and a varied experience over the years in, in this field um, initially working in the acute side in, in um, inpatient rehab so I have a, a, an understanding of, of, of that setting although things will have changed over the years I'm sure in the way services are, are set up and I, I know from from local knowledge but I have that that setting and then in latter years I've been working here at physio function and it's been a, a, a more of an outpatient setting um, I've always had a special interest in stroke recovery um, very much seeing it as the whole person recovery stroke doesn't just affect one little part of our brain or our body it affects so many aspects and that's something I find really fascinating and I've met so many wonderful, inspiring people along the years and just learned so much from patients, really, um, that, you know, it's, it's exciting to be here and hope, hope to share some of that with you today. Um, I do have a particular interest in drop foot and also in recovery of the upper limb. And I feel like all the time I'm learning and exploring new things with clients and patients and helping people along their journey and they're sharing things with me and helping me along my journey. Um, so I'm not going to use slides today. I just wanted to give a talk about how I feel we can help help each other reclaim our bodies after stroke. Um, happy that it's being recorded and that we can, you know, you can go back and look over things if, if you need to. I think the three main things I've learned from patients over the years is um, an acceptance, not an acceptance that this is it and this is how it's always going to be, but an acceptance of where things are now and huge amounts of patience for themselves, for their carers, and again, with carers and relatives, a huge amount of patience on their behalf and also just determination to keep going, keep plugging away, keep moving forward in different ways it isn't just a, a linear path. There are so many encompassing factors and just the determination to keep going. They're the, the three things that I think really are useful skills for all of us across many aspects of our life in, in any, any of the challenges we face, um, family, home, work, friendships. Um, so they're, they're the, the real things I've learned. So the topic for today, um, reclaiming your body, physical recovery after stroke. 
it's a huge topic. Um, so I'm going to try and do, do it justice. I thought a lot about how I wanted to present um, this. I, I, I feel like bombarding with facts and figures isn't very helpful because inevitably, if we say so many percentage of people get this, there's going to be so many percentage of people that don't. Um, so I want to really focus on some core values and, and, and sort of take those concepts forward because um, it's going to be so different for everybody. Um, we're all different anyway, and then a stroke comes along and it affects part of our brain and it's gonna affect us differently to other people. Um, there's gonna be different circumstances and different situations. So let's try and look at a, a big picture approach. Um, I'm going to cover four main topic areas and then there's some going to be some questions at the end. And I've already said to Austin, you know, happy if there's anything to pick up on afterwards, you know, happy to follow that up with, with people as, as best I can. So broadly speaking, we're going to look at initial recovery, long-term recovery, provision of services within the NHS and privately. And of course, I want to discuss some of the work that the, the wonderful work that Different Strokes does. So I have got some notes because I want to make sure I don't forget anything. So you may see me just glance at those. So initial physical recovery after stroke. So broadly speaking, we're, we're gonna have a, a starting point and that's gonna be different for all of us. And part of our recovery is recognizing that the stroke is the start and then everything else is recovery. Of course, we're going to look back and think of the things that we used to be able to do and, and could do pre-stroke. And that's really important because that's a really important part of our life and we can't forget those things. But it's also then looking at this new phase, this new chapter in, the, in our life of, of the stroke being the beginning of a new part of our life and that everything from there is recovery, which is going to be different for everybody and looking at all the different aspects of recovery. So as a physiotherapist, obviously we are looking at movement recovery and modulation of tone, but I think it's really important that we look at the whole person recovery. It's, it's no good having brilliant range of movement and muscle tone if we don't can't put those into aspects of our life that are important to us as individuals. So it's trying to think of, of the whole person. So the size and the nature of the stroke will vary. Um, and we can't alter this. That's a part of our acceptance that this event has occurred. Um, we want to take preventative measures to prevent any further damage. Um, and, you know, they will be a wide range of things that will be recommended um, or interventions that will happen. So we can't affect what has happened, but we very much can affect what does happen in the future. And that future is going to be different for all of us but it is something that we can affect and it's finding the ways that work for us to affect those changes. Mm -hmm. So timelines are, are something that everybody wants to know. And I completely get that because if you just think if I can, you know, if it's just going to be two months of hard work, I can do that. I can see it through. And it's very difficult as a professional to give timelines People will ask, and I will always do my best to be just completely honest and draw on my experience and say, well, in my experience, I, I think we're looking at so many weeks or months um, to affect these changes. But it's very difficult to give a specific timeline. And I don't want that to sound like a cop out, but I think professionals will be wary. The one thing I will say is don't let anybody write you off. Don't let somebody say, if you don't change by six weeks, that's game over. Because that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it doesn't have to be. You know, that there, there are things that are going to be more challenging for some people than others. And, and you know, that's that's unfortunately a, a fact we have to accept, but it doesn't mean that we can't change. So timelines can be useful to set ourselves challenges and goals and targets but don't be beholden to them. Don't let somebody write you off and say, if you haven't achieved this by six weeks, you won't achieve it. They can't, you know, that, that's a very difficult thing for them to say. So some people may say, oh, whether well, you're saying it's try and prove me wrong or, you know, which is fine, but I think we all need a bit of a, 
a, a nurture and a, a carrot approach rather than a stick or a ticking clock that's coming down. So just be wary of, of, of pinning your pinning your um, and you know hopes on onto a onto a, a specific time scale. Because what we do know is that things can change. And we've got this concept of neuroplasticity, which is just like this big, wonderful light glowing at the end of the tunnel. So for, for those of you who ha haven't been sort of uh, advised and informed about neuroplasticity, I'm sure many of you will have done. But sort of in summary, it's just the way that our body can adapt and make changes in its neurological system after an event. And this is true not only in, in uh, stroke patients, but across the neurological patient spectrum, but also in people who haven't suffered that kind of um, that kind of neurological event. So in a sports person, we can still make neurological and neuroplastic changes. Our bodies are wonderful and amazing things, which we understand a lot about, but also very little. But we can make neuroplastic changes. We put in the stimulus to our bodies and our system, our bodies will respond, absorb that information, and we can make changes. We can tread a new path down uh, through our nervous system. So if our arm function isn't working, if we can ac access the movement into the arm, maybe initially with uh, assisted movements, then with movements that are, are guided by the by, um, patient and then assisted, and then independent movements. We're reinforcing that pathway. So we've got this light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes the tunnel can seem that it goes dark and dim. We've just got to keep pushing on and trying to affect those changes. And those, those changes will come. Sometimes we need a little bit of a different stimulus. Sometimes we, we need a bit of a rest and we need a bit of a change. But the neuroplasticity doesn't have a timeline on it. It's there and it will continue to be there. The, the thing that makes a difference is the input we put in. And what we do know is that the more input we put in, the greater the neuroplastic potential changes are. But we need to be wary of fatigue. We can't just keep hammering ourselves if we're tired. We need to treat this period of rehabilitation like an athlete would. You know, we're in training. We've got to look after ourselves, eat well, sleep well, have good fluid intake, have good rest periods. There's nothing more important than having, you know, rest periods because our bodies need that time to rest, recover and build. You know, we wouldn't expect a professional athlete to be hammering away at the same program day in, day out. That wouldn't work for them. And it, and it won't work as effectively for us. So it's, it's thinking about all these factors that will help affect these neuroplastic changes, make a difference to how your body can recover. So in that, the neuroplasticity is there. It's there in all of us. It's there in me now. If I want to learn a new skill, I'm going to neuroplastically change my neurological system. If I decide I want to sort of take up gymnastics, which I won't, <laughs> but... I need to make those neuroplastic changes. So they're there all of the time within all of us. When we've had a stroke or a neurological event, we're finding new paths. And it's tough and it's challenging, but it's there and it can be done. So the first three months are thought to be the, the state of the most heightened neuroplasticity. Again, I said it would be too given too many timelines, but we know that that's roughly the case when things are most open to change. But what we also know is that the recovery that we see, that spontaneous recovery, is, is in part due to the, the swelling around the area in the brain that's been affected, be it a clot or a bleed. There will be swelling. It's an insult to the brain. There's an injury in the brain. And there will be naturally be swelling. And as that subsides, we start to see that most um, spontaneous period of recovery, which is, which is good. But it doesn't mean if it doesn't happen that we can't still get further recovery. But those first few months, can be the time really where we expect to see spontaneous changes. And it, that might be where we see more of our initial functional changes. So that might be from being able to, not being able to sit up to being able to sit confidently on the edge of the bed. But if you can't do that at three months, it doesn't mean you won't do it. I've seen plenty of people keep plugging away and getting there so that the changes can still be made. It's just commonly that's when we'll see most things. and where we will hopefully have a lot of physiotherapy input at those times, but also we'll have 
probably lots of support from friends and family and loved ones and hopefully and, and, and different associations that are helping us to make these functional changes. So those first three months um, are really that, that, that sort of that period where we'll see the spontaneous changes. Um, I was looking up a, a sort of a few different ideas of things for the talk, and I found a, a quote that's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Um, and I quite liked it. There are probably some holes in it, and we'll never know if it really was him. But anyway, start doing what is necessary. So those necessaries might just be that the necessary might be I need to... Um, you know, our basics, our feeding, our watering, our sleeping, those things. Start doing what is necessary, then do what is possible. So we start by doing a few things that are possible each day. And then suddenly you are doing the impossible. So what you thought was impossible in week one or two of your stroke, you will start to see the changes and doing things you didn't think were possible. So it's just got to be a process that's worked through and the timeline will be different for all of us, but it's start doing with what is necessary. And it's not a bad mantra for us to have every day. Do what is necessary, then I'll do what is possible, and then I will go and work on the, the impossible. The other thing to bear in mind in this initial few months is there's an awful lot going on. There's a process of grief. However the strokes affected you, whether somebody will say to you, well, it's a mild stroke or it's a, you know, a severe stroke, there's going to be a process of, of grief in, in everybody, I believe. Um, and it's, it's a process that we work through. So we have sort of the shock, the denial, the anger, and the bargaining phase, depression, testing ourselves, and, and then moving on to acceptance. And these processes will be worked through over a period of time. And some of us will find it easier than others to move through this. We may feel like we get a bit stuck and we need some help and support, um, but it is a process and it's it's not wrong to have grieved what you've lost, whatever that is. You know, if someone says, well, you've only had a mild stroke, you've still lost something. You know, it's, it's, it is a loss of your normal uh, function, but we can affect those changes. And once we get sort of working through, through the process towards an acceptance, um, was probably starting to move forwards into sort of more of a longer term rehab. And when I say acceptance, I want to be really clear there. I'm not saying accept this is your lot and that's it. You can't do anything about it. And, and that's it. Not at all. It's acceptance of where things are now. And that takes time to accept. And, it, you know, there's it's a challenge, but I'm, I'm here now. And then I've got to plan for moving forward and then we will start to see changes. So it is a big process and it might be a factor where, where external support is required and is necessary to help move forward in that, in that phase. So it can be quite overwhelming in this initial period for not just the, the person who suffered the stroke, but also for their family, their friends, their relatives. There's that initial um, shock and, and panic and then the, right, let's get you home, let's get home, let's get started. And once we get home, I just want to get home. And then once you get home, of course, then you want, want to, oh, I want to be able to walk to the toilet. I would like to be able to try and do this. I'd like to be able to feed myself and dress myself. So it's, it can be completely overwhelming. There may also be, of course, speech and language challenges. So there's an awful lot of things going on. And it's probably very hard at this point to look and cut yourself a bit of slack. Um, and probably for a lot of you, that period has obviously has come and gone and you might look back on it and think, oh, I wish I had cut myself, myself a bit of slack. But you've now in the position where we're working with within different strokes, you've got the power to, to say this to your, to your um, fellow stroke survivors and, and use your experience to share with others, which I think is one of the most powerful things and one of the brilliant things that Different Strokes does so well, it, is that helping the next, the next person and that, that sense of community amongst the stroke survivors that, yeah, I was there, I felt that, and now I'm on to this next stage and it will come because I think that's so important when it comes from somebody who has being a stroke survivor it's so much more powerful and resonant and and that's one really powerful thing that that 
that you guys can do that a healthcare professional can't do. We haven't walked the you know the walk, as they say, the phrase. Um, and I think that's a really, a really powerful thing that different strokes can do. So we kind of think of short term recovery as being sort of the first three months. And then we'll come on to long term recovery, which is really, in my opinion, without and I mean this in a very positive way. This is the rest of your the rest of your life is this long term recovery. It's 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 bringing your rehabilitation into your into your lifestyle. Um, there's going to be very specific things that you need to do to, to promote your recovery. Um, maybe some specific physiotherapy interventions or um, exercise therapy interventions, but also general day-to-day -day activities that are therapeutic and beneficial to your recovery that will become part of your everyday life. Again, it's gonna vary for everybody. So it's really focusing now, I think, on what what you want from your rehabilitation. Um, it's got to be purposeful and rewarding to you. So for some people, it, it might be that for them, they, they get their rewards through measuring, you know, uh, a, a physical challenge that they want to try and achieve. For others, it might be that they can go and enjoy time with family and friends. It's, it's, very, going to be very different for everybody, but we, we need some core factors to, for each of us to bring those together. So the, your lifestyle is going to come, um, be, your rehab rather, is going to become part of your lifestyle. But remember, we've still got this neuroplasticity light at the end of the tunnel that's still there, and we can still affect the changes there in that neuroplasticity. But what we might find as we go into longer term recovery is that we need to change the input a little bit. So what, what was useful at first is now maybe not making those changes. It's maybe not challenging enough in, in the different ways. So this is where hopefully you'll be, have the opportunity to work with a local physiotherapist from um, within the NHS provision, um, or you may seek some privately um, sourced physiotherapy or working with your friends, but also of course, working with the different strokes group and just trying to find different ways of changing, um, changing the input slightly to make it interesting to your brain, to make this neuroplasticity want to light up and fire up um, and, really, and really challenge yourself in, in achieving the goals that you want to achieve. Of course, as soon as you set yourself a goal and then you work towards it and you get nearer, you'll then start moving the goalpost a little bit, which is brilliant. And that's what we want people to do. And that's what we like, because when they sort of say, yeah, yeah, I know that I can do it, but I want this now and I want that now. So we kind of, it's, it's as we develop in our lives, we all change and develop in our lives. We seek the next thing that we want to be able to do, the next challenge, and that's fine and that's brilliant. So, you know, goals, goals may come and go, or we may think that's really important to me. And then actually over time, well, yeah, okay, I've changed a bit now. I think I'd like to work on this and that's fine. So again, if you, if you, if you achieve a goal and you set yourself another goal, that's great. If you, if you think, actually, I'm just not quite achieving that goal. I need to change something. Take a different path and you might find that you achieve that goal that way or you might find that actually what I thought was really important isn't anymore and it's much more important to me that I pursue this, this line of recovery. But the most important thing to remember in this long-term phase is that neuroplasticity is there. Changes will come and your brain can and will continue to change. We just need to keep putting the stimulus in. And that's the tricky bit because we can all get a bit bogged down in, 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 in things and, and life can take over and we need to do other things, but that will still be there. So you may have some time out. You may just think, do you know what? I've, I've, had, I've had enough for a while. I just need to give myself a little bit of a breather, a bit of a break. I'm going to take some, some time out and, and do this instead. So there isn't a right or a wrong. It's just remembering that the, the neuroplasticity is there. We can access it, but we just have to give ourselves the challenges to change and to make those, those changes. Then the other thing I wanted to mention, which I'm sure many of you will have, have had brought up to you is the plateau. This, this phrase of, well, you've plateaued. 
and I think, well, what does that really mean? You know, what what is this person trying to tell me if they say, well, you've plateaued? Because it's usually with a bit of a negative spin on it. Um, is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, if I say to them they've plateaued, then I don't really have to do anything else to help. And then, you know, I'm, I'm handing it over, you know, as a, as a healthcare professional, is it like, well, you've plateaued, so we're not going to do anything else. So I kind of went and just had a look at the de dictionary definition of what a plateau is, um, just to be sort of clear for myself. Um, so a plateau, if we think in sort of geographically, is a large area of fairly, a large flat area, fairly high ground. So I was thinking then, well, when we look, let's look at it differently. Let's re rethink how we're going to address this because people are going to say it to, to stroke survivors, you know, that we're not going to stop people saying it, I think. So let's rethink how we approach it. So this large area of, of fairly high ground, large flat area. So if we were sat on the plateau or stood on the plateau of a, a mountainside, we'd be up high. We'd have, we'd have come a distance, which is true. All of you in your recovery will have made changes and will have come on a journey. You will have come a distance. You may have reached a plateau. You may have reached a period where you're having a, a little consolidation, a rest, a recoup, a bit of a regrouping. And you've, your body needs that, you know, we need, when whatever skill we're learning, we need that period of consolidation. We're not going to go off on a, a linear route all the time in any skill that we're learning. So actually being on this plateau isn't a bad thing. If we think of it in a geographical and a sort of mountain town, we've earned that. We've earned that. We can look back and we can see. We can see we've got a great view from this plateau of what is around us, what we've achieved, what has helped us get to this point. So I think we need to rethink and think, OK, you're saying I've plateaued and you might be having negative connotations of that. But let me think of it and put my spin on it that I've reached a plateau. I've reached a geographical resting point. I've reached a little period where my body is just re is reviewing things, redressing, absorbing. And then I can see what's ahead. I can see if I want to go up that path, if that's the right path for me, but I might want to go up a different path. So again, don't let anybody write you off. Don't let anybody put their limitations of their abilities onto you and say, well, you've reached a plateau and that's it. See that plateau as being a point where you can reflect and absorb take maybe a little bit of a rest, a bit of a change, a bit of a time out, and you can see where your path takes you next. But that light is still shining, that neuroplasticity is still there, and it's still available. Um, the other thing that's just in this section, I've just noticed, I noted down, is also thinking of things. So we've talked about rehab being and recovery being part of your lifestyle. And each of you as individuals being part of different strokes, I've got so much to give back to the stroke community. So joining a group, volunteering for something, other things that things like maybe signing up to a study. If there's, you know, often we're asked to recruit people to studies about stroke rehab. And it's really useful because your experience is the most valuable resource we have and your insight and your input. So it doesn't necessarily always have to be about how many exercise, how many repetitions of exercise I do. It's recovering your, your body and you as a person. So it might be volunteering. It might be that now you feel, well, actually, now I feel ready to, to um, go and meet up with that group of friends or interact with my grandchildren. And, and actually, those things aren't so tired now. So maybe I haven't made, you know, people, are, I, I've noticed Functionally, I'm, I'm, I'm using a stick to walk and I maybe wanted to progress away from that. But actually now I have got all these other skills that I can use and bring um, into my whole body recovery. So try and at this point also reflect and look at the different aspects of your life. Um, so it doesn't just become physio focus, but you're looking at, well, now... I've consolidated those skills and I'm much more confident. It's much more, it's much easier when I go out and meet my friends for, for lunch because walking into the restaurant is a little bit easier. Or I feel I can sit at the table for a bit longer without feeling so tired. Or when a friend comes round, I'm much more comfortable. Um, so trying to look for all those little changes, which can be really hard um, as an individual. But again, 
it might just be worth making note and, and sort of reflecting back when you're feeling you're having a period where you're not moving on, that there are changes, um, it's, it's looking for them. Right, so physiotherapy provision. Um, so obviously, mo all of you will have had NHS provision to start with, and that might have started and ended in the hospital, it might have continued in a rehab centre or at home. Um, Often this input will be limited in the, the time that can be given because of the resources. And unfortunately that's um, often the limiting factor. It's, 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 I believe it's never, never you that's the limiting factor, it's the resources that are available because unfortunately there will be another person that comes in and needs stroke rehabilitation and stroke care. Um, so, take up as much provision as can it. We know it will vary widely from area to area. My advice would always be just take everything you're offered to start with. And then if some of it is not as useful to you or you feel isn't beneficial, it, you know, and it can and it will, um, it will uh, diminish. But just take, take what you can. Input at home is really good because it's where you start making those changes and finding those, those reasons for doing things. You know, well, now I can sit uh, more solidly. I can have my breakfast at the table and I can reach for the, for the jam or I can reach for my coffee. And all of those are rehabilitation. So take those opportunities to have, if you get given them, to have people come into the home after your rehabilitation. And then it might be that going out somewhere uh, for rehabilitation afterwards is, is that change that comes. Private physiotherapy is, um, is out there. There's, there are across the country, plenty of specialist neurophysiotherapists who work privately. Um, and it gives some you know, opportunity for, for progressing on in, particular, in certain areas. Um, and it's just finding a physiotherapist that you feel you can work with and, and having that relationship with them and looking at what your goals are and you know what you, what you want to achieve from it and their professional opinion. So um, often we'll use we'll still use hands-on techniques, we'll still use exercise therapy, um, we'll we may use some sort of technology. Now that could be um, you know great big machines in the clinic that help with certain movements or it you know, the technology could be an uh, electrical stimulation unit that you can use at home. So there's a wide variety of things that, that can be done. Um, and I know here we, we really value, I think Rhiannon's out this morning at Northampton, different strokes group doing an exercise group face to face. And those different strokes exercise groups that are running um, five days a week are brilliant because they give everybody well, most people access, um, assuming you've got the, the internet facility to access YouTube and their videos are all there and they're all logged and they're stored. So it's once you made that decision to turn on and put that video on, you're going to gain something from it. You might not manage to finish the whole thing, but next day or the next couple of days, you know, you can have another go and another try. So those things are all there. And the 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 experience that you bring back into different strokes from your experiences and speaking with others is just as valuable as the things that you will you gain from attending the exercise classes so I think as a resource it's such a, a huge and important thing and it's doing that that thing that keeping that neuroplasticity ticking over and you can control that that's something that you can do by accessing these videos finding the, the level that suits you for where you're up at the moment and working together with that. Um, so in summary, it's going to be a very different journey for each and every one of us. So our key things are, I think, as much as you can, trying to see the, the things that you control and controlling your controllables and working towards that light at the end of the tunnel. All the input that you put in, which can be varied, it can be just, ex it can be exercise based, it can also be social interactions, housework. Um, different types of training, all those interactions you put into your physical recovery as your journey progresses on will help you reclaim yourself and who you are after your stroke. I'm conscious of the time, so I thought we'd maybe move on to some questions. Thank you, Claire. That, that, that was absolutely fantastic. And 
I can tell from the comments that we've had in the chat and the questions that we've had coming through that, that what you've said has really, really resonated with, with a lot of people who are watching this morning. Um, just to pick up a few of uh, um, comments that we have, and a lot of them are regarding um, the timings, really. So there's a comment here. A friend of mine had a stroke in 2005. The NHS at the time told him all recovery would happen in the first two years, but he feels he's still recovering at about half a percent of the year now, 16 years later. Um, I think recovering doesn't have timings. Everyone has their own timings. I was told by a stroke doc, if I hadn't got movement back by five months, um, it's unlikely I ever will. Um, and there's a lovely comment about um, your plateauing as well. And I love, I love, comparison that you drew there but um, I, another person's commented thinking about the plateau fell walking also has false summits you think you can see the summit then as you progress you see another summit you catch your breath have a swig of water eat a snack and push on again um, yeah, until you brilliant. reach like the point you don't know you've completed the full hike stroke recovery I think it's the same so I think that's absolutely fantastic simile yes yeah yeah, um, yeah I like that. Uh, we've had so many questions in. I will get through as many of them um, as I can. Um, some of them, again, are more general ones, some of them more specific. Um, so to ask, um, first of all, a couple of ones regarding the timing. It's been asked, um, and you touched on this in your talk, is it possible to get movement back after a year? Um, but another question, I guess, that's... Um, kind of linked in with this as well, um, which also regards timings. Can you illustrate some examples of the, of the gradual moving of exercise goalposts that you spoke of, maybe with times or proportions of the percentages of the journey? Right, I'll try. Yes, yeah, so it is possible to get movement back after years. We see it day in, day out with our, with our clients in the clinic. And yeah, so, these, these sort of, uh, you know, oh, you won't get any recovery after so many years. It's just not true. You can change. You, you, we see it all the time. So don't, don't be written off. Don't let that be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You, you know, you still can affect changes. So in terms of sort of goalposts and timescales, um, okay, so I was trying to think of, that's where a, a, a really good relationship with uh physiotherapist would be really helpful because they can help maybe help you break down the tasks into the component parts and look at okay well we've got so say we're say we're looking at walking well well we've got movement uh range of movement in the joint we've got strength in those muscles albeit they may be a little bit weak but we're needing so we we know we've got those two elements and then it's the coordination and the balance and they might be these two elements you're working on but of course obviously if you've got a, a physiotherapist you're working with they can help you break down those goals but it's something to sort of consider of trying to break down the goal that you're wanting to achieve into into chunks and seeing well I think I need these five components but I'm pretty good at two of them but I haven't got the other three yet so I maybe need to practice those as tasks and then try and put them together um, into achieving the final goal. So maybe you can set, set yourself intermediate, like, uh, you know, posts on a, on a fence post. You're sort of aiming to walk to the end, but I've, I've, I've just got to try and chunk it, make it into chunks of achieving a cup, you know, can I... I've got some strength and I've got some movement. I need to work on my balance. Okay, I'm pretty good at standing still now, right? I need to now work on, can I move Can I move that leg out and back? Not walking, just doing a couple of steps and just trying to break it into chunks to make it a less of an overwhelming um, task. Thank you. Um, someone asked a quick question about um, upper limb problems. How do I manage the use of upper limbs when in constant pain? Yeah, this is really hard because when we're in pain, we don't we don't function as well. We, you know, if we, it's a it's a really hard thing to manage. Um, and we we can all at some level relate to being in pain with something, and you just sort of struggling to do all the things that normally would come barely, barely okay. So yeah, it's it's a real problem. With upper limb pain, there's quite often 
a, a couple of things. So we can have sort of um, like a structural pain from having a subluxed shoulder. Um, and it can be quite specific to that area where our shoulder joints come out of place because the muscles are weak with the stroke. Um, and it, it can be very painful, as any of you have ever suffered a, a frozen shoulder or anything like that will know, it can be very painful, excuse me. Um, and then also there is a phenomenon um, of central post-stroke pain, CPSP, um, which is a, a neuropathic pain. And it tends to be much more global throughout the arm. Um, doesn't always happen at first, and then it can develop. Um, so it's difficult to know what sort of problem pain this person is having. The advice um, will be similar, but if, if it's a, a post-stroke pain, a neuropathic pain, it may be something that you, you need to pursue more with uh, medics as well as, as physiotherapists, but uh, a subluxation, more localised pain, may be more of a physiotherapist role. Um, pain relief is needed. Um, and is useful. So don't be, if, as long as it's okay but by your GP to take pain, regular pain relief, because our bodies won't repair and move if we're, if we're in pain. If we can modulate that with some pain relief, that's great. So that could be analgesia as prescribed by your GP, but it also can be um, using, um, with caution of course, um, any sensory input, so some heat or some cold therapy. And TENS machines can often be really useful. Because what we're trying to do when we address any type of pain is recalibrate the, 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 pain, the pain mechanism. Um, often with the, more so with the, the post-stroke pain, the neuropathic pain, structures are interpreting lots of stimulus as pain. And, and with lot, your, for whatever reason, and it's nothing that you've done, it's just the way the stroke has affected you, you aren't able to regulate what these different sensations are. So they're all perceived as pain. So everything is uncomfortable, which maybe is what this, this question is, is more a, a, sort of aligned to. Um, so we need to try and put some sensory input into there. And this can be really difficult. And it's just trying to start small and work, work into it. So if you can find an area of your arm that is less painful, can you start there with some sensory work, which by which I mean to touching, stroking, either yourself doing it or somebody else. So put some sensory input in there, which can be tolerated. For example, if I could think, well, this part of my hand is okay, but it's more painful up here. Work where it's okay, and then try and work into the area that's more uncomfortable. Not to cause more pain, but just to try and desensitize. Um, and we can use different sensations that go in. So touch of skin to skin, um, and then maybe a soft flannel, maybe something a little bit rougher, like a, a crunchy flannel, you know, one that's dried out too much, um, a toothbrush, that kind of thing, just to try and really work on the specific sensory elements. If trying to think about doing a whole movement is too much at the moment, let's just try and break it down into smaller areas um, and work through that. It's a really challenging problem, um, which I, I would advise where you maybe go back. I'm sure the person has gone back to their GP and said, look, I, I am in constant pain. And can you help me with some analgesia? And can you help me with some referral for some, some therapy? Which I know that is often a challenge to get those appointments and get those, those things rolling. But there are some things that you can do, as I've just said. And the other thing um, I've just thought of is also um, mindfulness, um, being able to control, just if you can get your um, use, maybe there's lots of widely available apps that help with, with um, mindfulness that can be quite short. Can you have just 10 or 15 minutes a day where you're able to access a, an app, some mindfulness techniques and focus on something other than the pain and then see if we can build up on that time in activities. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions in the Q&A that, uh, that are kind of related to this. Um, so what, what should you do if using a stick isn't comfortable or helpful? I feel like it can be awkward focusing on balance and holding my stick, especially on bad days. It can be because it's another thing to think about what to do with and where to put it. So quite often in your own home, people will not use a stick because they'll use what 
it used to be called, it might still be furniture walking, where you're just touching on the furniture and you find that sufficient balance to help you. Um, it depends um, if that person feels they're able to walk without a stick, um, they might find it more comfortable outside to walk if they're able to and they have got a partner they can rest their arm on. And that might be a more comfortable, more flowing movement to go with. Um, it's difficult obviously, to say it specifically without without having the person there to look at. Um, it, it a stick can be can be very useful, and some people like to keep hold of them a bit, especially when they're outside, because it gives a bit of a warning off to people of like, well, look, just give me a little bit of space, please. Doesn't always work, but you know, I just need a little bit more time, a little bit more space. Um, it might be worth looking at the height of the stick. Um, when you're stood, the stick should come to, with your arm relaxed by your side, to the knobbly bit on your um, wrist. So it might be worth checking that the stick is a good height for you. Um, the other thing that you could check if it's a problem with the pain of sort of gripping the stick, there are sticks with different handles that are a little bit more shaped um, that can help. And they're called Fisher stick handles, F I S C H E R, um, and they can help if the hand is a little um, arthritic, or the, the 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 effort of holding onto it can can sort of cause a bit of joint pain. That might be worth looking at. Thank you. Um, do you believe there's an actual time limit when the damaged nerve endings from a spinal cord infarction will no longer repair? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, there's usually when there's a, an event, whether it be a spinal cord infarction or if someone have a spinal cord injury, unless really you think that spinal cord has been whipped through with a sharp knife and completely cut in half, there are going to be traps and fibres that are still there and still have potential. So above and beyond, we'll try and repair um, you know, above, above and below, sorry, the, the uh, area of the lesion, we'll try and repair and find new pathways. So, again, I would say no. Let, the, I don't think there is an absolute time scale. It's maybe a case of changing the input, looking at different, um, different things that you can do. So there may be, there, there will be things that will be a challenge, but if you're stronger in different elements, so maybe focusing on, um, making tasks easier by uh, working on different aspects of your, your leg strength or your arm strength. But no, I don't believe there is an absolute end point. I think it's, it's always an evolving process. Um, I had a question here, GRASP, but that's G-R-A-S-P in capitals. GRASP is a well-known and freely accessible guidance on an upper limb programme. Are there similar guides with a specific focus on finger, hand, and wrist? I don't know, but I can find out. Okay. Thank you. That's Make right. a note. <laughs> That's a short and long and short of that one. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next one. Um, are there alternatives to Botox to help painful muscle spasms? Yes. Um, Yes, yeah, so that I've just seen someone put up, but perhaps the gripper ball could be useful for the, the hand program, which is which is a good uh, a good suggestion. It's worth looking at their at their resources. Um, yes, spasms. So yes, there there are lots of different ways. Now, quite often, if people have spasms or high muscle tone, they'll be put on a, a muscle relaxant, which can be an oral, often baclofen. Um, which suits some people, doesn't suit others, like lots of medications. So there are a range of oral medications that uh, your doctor may try with you, which will sort of generally, they, they, they more often work by generally reducing muscle tone and um, muscle activity, which can suit some people, but of course they may have a global effect, which doesn't suit everybody. Um, Botox is really useful if it's well used. Um, like most things in life. It can be seen as a bit of a panacea and it's gonna cure all, but it only really works if it's um, administered correctly into the correct areas of the muscle. Um, and also then followed up with a really good stretching and um, splinting program. So if you've been advised to go for an assessment for some Botox therapy, but then I, I would, by all, you know, that 
if you if you've got the appointment and you go but i would ask you know what is the regime what is the follow-up regime for stretches um for splinting you know it's 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 all well and good putting some Botox in to try and help open my hand up. But if I'm not provided with a splint or a stretching program, the Botox is going to be fighting a, a battle. It needs. So I'd always um, if, you, if you do go down the Botox route, ask those questions. If it's something that you don't um, think is suitable for. For yourself, um, other things that can be useful, um, soft tissue massage now. Of course, if you've got somebody to do that for you, that's great. There are self-massage techniques that you can do. I mean, you don't have to be a massage therapist. If, if your hand is tight and you can, you can see often and feel where the tension is in those muscles, any mus massage and rubbing over that area you know, is useful and will help. A physiotherapist could definitely advise on that and also advise you to how to get somebody that you live with or who could come in and help you do that. It doesn't have to be physio session all the time and stretches. The thing with those sorts of things, again, it's that regularity of doing it is, is the key, setting aside a bit of time to do it. Taping can often help. So you may have seen or used this kinesiotherapy tape, um, often see it on, on the athletes where they have strips of tape down their legs or in cross in various different positions and it, it is it does work and it is useful again that would be best advised with a, a physiotherapist or a sports therapist showing you where to apply the tape it works by helping sort of decompress the layers of the tissue so it can offer some relief and also it helps give your you know if your hand um can be looser and then gets tighter taping might just help it remind it it's giving appropriate sets of a sensory input well if i've got some tape on there and it's slightly pulling me back i don't pull so much into that tightness again it, initially it might need an input from a, a healthcare professional but then it's something that can be fairly um reasonably cost-wise achieved at home and fairly you know we have lots of our clients who go away and do that themselves the other things that can be useful is electrical stimulation. So we've got tight muscles in our flexors on this side that are pulling our hand in. Can we stimulate this side of our arm, the back side of our arm, to open up with electrical stimulation? Again, that's uh, something that can be done regularly at home and it's fairly easy to do once you've, you've been set up. Um, and the last thing really think of there is also what we call a sensory dynamic orthosis which is really a fancy, <laughs> fancy term for um, a, a garment that fits over the area of tightness and gives, it's a, compre a, a lightweight compression um, and that extra sensory information can seem to somehow uh, can help redress the balance between the tight, tightness in the muscles. Again, most, it would be best accessed through a physiotherapist, um, but I know in Northamptonshire, we have clients who come through the NHS who have these um, provided. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just got time for a couple more. Um, firstly, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this next question. Um, any guidance on the balance between doing exercise for progress versus over-exercising and causing a setback? E.g. I keep finding exercise curtailed by low back pain caused by the exercise of the day before um, so just wonder what your general thoughts are on this Claire. Yeah this this can be really difficult because we um, obviously the ideal would be that that you would be assessed and given exercises by a, a healthcare professional or an exercise specialist who's then sees you do them and reviews them and then say right I can see why that's causing a problem we need to work on this but that of course isn't necessarily always available there if an exercise is causing you pain my inclination would be to to stop that exercise but then we need to think of a, a maybe a different way of, of approaching it um or stop and rest so you've not got the pain and then maybe do a lower number of repetitions really focusing on your form and build up more uh, more gradually um, so that you're not maybe hitting that fatigue point as quickly. Um, when, when any neurological event has occurred, we've, we have less of a buffer. So it's harder. We can sort of maybe go hell for leather, but then we'll just reach that point where, where our, our system is exhausted. 
Um, so one of the ways I, I think about this is if, if an analogy from John Graham, our clinical director, I always remember this one, thinking of the, the you know, those big boats where you've got all the men rowing um, as hard as they can. And then if you lose some of those men, you can keep the boat going, but then you hit rough water and those men will get tired much more quickly. So it's trying to find that point. You haven't maybe got that buffer. So it's just thinking, right, well, I'm just going to go at a certain, at certain pace and build up more gradually and vary my exercise. So not doing the same thing every day. I maybe do um, legs one day and arm another day, um, have a day off in between if, if you're suffering with pain. Generally for, move, for pain, movement is good, but it's making sure it's the right movement. And that can be really tricky um, to, to self-manage, but there are a few tips there that on a general term, you know, would help. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we've just got, just got time for one more. Um, how do you go about employing a good physio and how do you know they are good? Well, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. I like that one. So um, all physiotherapists um, are, have to be registered with the Health Care Professions, Professions Council, the HCPC, which is a real mouthful. Um, and you can check that. Anyone can go on their register and put in. So if you go on to the HCPC website and look at physiotherapists, it will be lots of health professions on that website. You know, OTs, all that sort of allied health professions to medicine. And you go in and you put Claire Everett in, you will see that I am I'm registered. Um, so that's one way of checking if if the person is is registered. Um, and I would always ask if they are, and if they're registered also with the CSP, which is the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, because that shows you that A, they are uh, safe to practice, and B, registered with, the, with their professional body. They have an interest in their profession and maintaining their standards. In terms of how good they are, I guess it's trying to get that, that fit with, with you. Um, as individuals, we tend to sometimes work better with some people than other, but I always think your physiotherapist should install confidence in you. They should be finding things that you can do and helping you progress and progress on with those and move into the things that you can't do. We all learn best by building confidence in ourselves and finding things that we can achieve and then building on them, not setting you a series of things that are just seem so unachievable because that's miserable. It's miserable for everybody. You don't, you, you can't face trying to do them because you don't feel you can achieve them. And then for the physiotherapist, do we come out? Oh, you didn't do them, you know? Well, that's not really fair because you gave them things that they couldn't do. So I feel it's, it's building that relationship is really important, but I would, and I would recommend if you can, you find someone that you, you, you feel you can be honest and open with, and they should be giving you things that you can do and progress you on. And, um, you know, very much a, a, a carrot approach of, 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 we learn best when we're comfortable. Um, so if for any reason you don't feel comfortable with that person, it might be worth sourcing a, a different person. Thank you, thank you. And I think that's a really um, good point and a really important point to remember and, and a great way to um, bring such a fantastic session this morning to a close. So thank you so much for your time, Claire. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to ask you all the questions. We've had so many come through. Um, but if there is something that Claire hasn't covered in her talk or in the Q&A today that you would like to ask, please do contact us at Different Strokes. Please email us at info at differentstrokes.co.uk we'll be very very happy to forward them them on to Claire yeah and, and, yeah, and I'll, I'll do my very best to answer them I am on little disclaimer I am on annual leave next week but I won't forget and I will come back to you very because good. it's use it's really useful these questions that people ask it makes us think and and that's that's really important so thank you for your time everybody yeah um but once again um thank you for joining us this morning um We've still got, you know, three sessions left this week. So this afternoon, um, we have a session on our groups, which my colleague Caroline, our group coordinator, will be running. Um, tomorrow morning, we have a session on legal matters from Laura Barlow at Bolt, Bert and Kemp, our sponsors for this week. Um, and the session and the conference ends tomorrow afternoon with a session which 
um, was really successful last year. So I'd urge you to do join us for tomorrow afternoon session as you can, um, which will be a panel discussion chaired by our chair of trustees, Ranj Palmer, um, and including um, a number of experts um, in their area, including Claire's colleague, John, of physiofunction, um, and also Dr. Giles Yates, Melanie Derbyshire, um, expert on aphasia and sitting to Sangara, stroke survivor and trustee of different strokes. So please do join us for any of those sessions if you can. Once again, thank you to Claire this morning. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing all of you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.